264. Agriculture. Calcedon Report number 63, November the 1st, 1970. We have been analysing in our recent reports the meaning of upper class culture. An upper class is the future oriented element in a society. The term upper class does not mean members of a social register. Such people are all too often lower class and present oriented today. An upper class is made up of those who have a realistic and future-oriented perspective. Such people forego present pleasures in terms of future goals and plans. They plan and execute their affairs in terms of providing for a future for themselves and for society under God. An upper class provides the spiritual and material capitalization of a society. The lower class decapitalizes a culture. Because a lower class is present-oriented, it uses up inherited spiritual, intellectual and economic capital without any realistic planning for tomorrow. The lower class man dreams about the future. The upper class man works to bring it into being. The relationship of agriculture to class is a very important one. Farming and ranching require a certain amount of foresight in order to operate, at least passively. Historically, the fact that the suppliers of food have been lower class has meant that food has been a chronic problem in world history, and most people have lived at the bare subsistence level. In England, under George III, an important change took place in agriculture. Britain, defeated by the American colonies, and while apparently declining into insignificance as a power, actually began to revive and moved ahead to its greatest strength. The agricultural revolution was a basic aspect of this change. Agriculture had been a meagre way of life for many people. Now lords and gentlemen saw their lands as fields of investment and as areas for skill and scientific management. The sandy soils of eastern England were made highly productive. Robert Bakewell defined a sheep as a machine for turning grass into mutton. As White notes, Nothing less than aristocratic patronage and resources could have achieved the transformation of agricultural organisation and technique within the intensely conservative society of rural England at that time. Even King George III began to patronise agricultural reform and to be proud of the title Farmer George. R.J. White, The Age of George III, New York, New York, Walker, 1968, pages 10 and 11. Some have bewailed this agricultural evolution. It forced many poor tenants off the land, into the cities or to America. The half-starved tenants found work in the cities, and the Industrial Revolution had the manpower to move ahead. Those who bewail the conditions of the working class then forget that it was a major step upward for them economically. This continuing agricultural revolution has taken a major step forward in recent years, especially since World War I. It is a fallacy of the lower class mind to see things in terms of numbers by counting noses. We are told by such people that half the labour force was on the farm in 1900. As recently as 1945, one third of the US population was on the farm. Now it is less than 10%, and especially with the move of the southern black into cities, it is dropping even lower. But does this mean the decline of agriculture in importance to the economy? In reality, fewer men are producing more food than ever before. According to Drucker, the main engine of economic growth in the developed countries during the last 20 years has been agriculture. In all these countries, excepting only Russia and their European satellites, productivity on the farm has been increasing faster than in the manufacturing industries. Peter F. Trucker, The Age of Discontinuity, New York, New York, Harper and Row, 1969, page 5. The steel industry is second to agriculture, as a moving force behind our recent economic expansion, and steel faces problems because of obsolete methods. Railroads, electronics, plastics and other areas of industry all lag behind agriculture, where a smaller labour force has steadily increased its productivity. The American expansion, as well as the Japanese, has been possible 
because agricultural progress has supplied the country both with food and a released labour force to make industrial growth possible. Japan, with 60% of its population in farming at the end of World War II, now has barely 20% on the farm. Drucker feels that a period of very fast increase in farm productivity for the developed countries may be just ahead. Page 14 Agriculture has become, in these countries, the most technologically advanced and the most industrialised of basic industries. Page 11 The results of this development are important. In America, it has meant that less and less of a man's income has to go to food, since food has been produced more cheaply. In lower class cultures, a major portion of a man's income has to go for enough food to survive. Today, the percentage of income spent for food is at an all-time low in the United States, but with a larger consumption per person. This releases more money for other expenditures or for capitalization. As the Farm Journal has observed, Our amazing farm productivity is a chief reason for our national affluence. Americans can spend 86 cents out of every dollar of personal income for things other than food. In India, where they have only 40 cents left per dollar after buying food, the economy can't get off its back. Russia has a third of her workforce tied up producing food. She can marshal resources to go to the moon, but it's a disappointing trip to the Russian food store. Moreover, farmers are industry's best customer, using each year one half as much steel as the automobile industry, enough rubber to put tires on 85% of the new cars, and more petroleum than any other industry. Farming employs more people than any other industry and is the biggest customer for the products of the nation's workers. In 1970, farmers' production expenditures will reach $40 billion, with another $32 billion of family spending. Farm Journal, October 1970, page 62. One reason why many businessmen who try to enter into agriculture lose heavily is because they are not accustomed to operating as carefully and narrowly as farmers and ranchers. What does all this mean? It means that, while the urban culture of the cities of the Western world has declined from its status as the vanguard of civilization and become steadily an area of lower-class culture, the countryside, once a lower-class area, has become progressively middle- and upper-class in character, There is a significant trend of once great industrial families to the land, to successfully operating farms and ranches. The fact that agriculture has had proportionately fewer federal controls has stimulated its growth as an area of freedom and enterprise. This does not mean that the future of agriculture is assured. The California grape strike and the lettuce strike represent an important indicator. California wages are higher than those of other states. The strikers have asked for much more per hour than grape pickers of any calibre regularly make. The key lies elsewhere. The productivity of California has made it America's chief supplier of foods. In some products, 90 to 100% comes from California. In very many, over 50% of the nation's supply is California grown. Control of California farm labour and the ability to strike and to stop the flow of that produce to market could, in a general strike, produce food rationing across the United States in a fairly short time. There's much more that can be said. The 1970 corn blight is straw in the wind. Abuse of the soil and its microorganisms, plus hybrid plants, more productive sometimes, but also more vulnerable, has been a part of the growing present-oriented perspective which mines the soil rather than developing it. Oil companies and their subsidiaries are now major advertisers in farm periodicals, in one case an owner apparently, and their products have been heavily promoted. Short-term gains have been real. Long-term consequences are probably equally real and a potential threat. Rural conservatism has also eroded. The country and small-town church long remained Christian when its city branches were captured. Today, the dry rot of unbelief has infected the countryside. The man firmly grounded in scripture is future-oriented. He is required by God to be responsible in all things, 
redeeming the very time of day as a religious duty. For many generations, Puritan children and many Americans were brought up on Isaac Watts' Divine and Moral Songs for Children. The first, third and fourth stanzas of one of the best known read, How doth the little busy bee improve each shining hour and gather honey all the day from every opening flower. In works of labour or of skill, I would be busy too, for Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. In books or work or healthful play, let my first years be past, that I may give for every day some good account at last. I recall, while a student at the University of California at Berkeley, hearing a degenerate professor of English read this poem as a prize joke, and the large class roared with laughter. A new generation, a lower class, had been born and was being bred to despise work, thrift and responsibility. We should not be surprised at what has happened in recent years. Each area of the upper class mentality is being overwhelmed and destroyed by the lower class, of which the modern university is a major representative. A recent murder of an entire family had, as its excuse, only one fact. They were rich, and the murderer hated them for it. The murdered man had begun in very poor circumstances, unlike the murderer. The lower class mentality is given to envy. Its action is basically twofold, to spend and to destroy. A lower class culture is thus easily led into revolution as its solution to problems. Our need today is for a new upper class. It cannot be created without a thorough and systematically biblical faith. Christian reconstruction begins with man, regenerated in Christ, and then proceeds to reordering the world 